Okay, so it is his birthday. Harry van der Velde, or van der Velt, uh, I should have checked uh, his, um, uh, the spelling of his name. Um, but uh, all in all, we are, we are dealing with a complex uh, uh, man, a complex uh, personality in the field of architecture. And he, he was not only an architect, he also uh, painted and um, wrote. And so he had, a, again, it's very, very important that you students of architecture become cultural uh, uh, you know, transformers of society and life. And, and to do that, you need a culture that is not resumed to, is not even resumed to architecture. You have to know other things. And uh, architects in general were good at multidisciplinarity and not from now. Imhotep, the first architect in history, as we know it, was a, um, a vizier, a grand uh, uh, administrator for Pharaoh Zoser, was a, was a doctor. Uh, so he, he practiced even medicine as it was practiced uh, 5,000 years ago, uh, was an architect. He erected the first pyramid in stone in steps, the pyramid of Saqqara. And, you know, 250 years or so later, he was deified. And, and, you know, I'm not saying that you should be necessarily be deified, but I think um, at least at a metaphysical level, I think it is good to aspire to become, uh, to achieve your, your highest potential. And to achieve your highest potential, you really need a, a dedication to culture, to ideas, to art, to architecture. Le Corbusier says it clearly in that letter that I sent you to the whole, uh, um, second year at Minku, uh, where he says that the architect is supposed to be the, the best uh, informed uh, uh, about, um, about art. And I see with sadness that this is not the case at this moment, but it could be the case. It, it's really up to you. If you choose to become uh, just a uh, prestator de servici, uh, you could, but I don't think you would be happy. If you want to become a, 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 an architect who is respecting soci respected in society as a, as, a, as a cultural figure, remembering again what Alvar Alto said, that architecture belongs to culture, not to civilization. And this, this short phrase coming from a reticent man like Alto, for me, it has a lot of weight. So anyway, let's come back to Henry van der Velde. Uh, he had a, a little bit of a longer name, uh, Henry Clemens van der Velde. Um, so was born on April 3rd, 1863. Uh, so he was uh, older than, um, than Le Corbusier uh, and he died uh, about uh, nine years before Le Corbusier. He was a Belgian painter, architect, interior designer and art theorist. You see, that's exactly what I'm saying. Painter, architect, interior designer, and art theorist. Together with Victor Horta and Paul Hankar, he's considered one of the founders of Art Nouveau in Belgium. He worked in Paris, Paris with Samuel Bing, the founder of the first gallery of Art Nouveau in Paris. Van der Velt uh, spent the most important part of his career in Germany and became a major figure in the German Jugendstil, which is the equivalent of the, of, of the Art Nouveau. He had a decisive influence on German architecture and design at the beginning of the 20th century. And I really would love to, to know that, that some of you at least will, will, will have an activity as rich as he had. If you cannot build necessarily because you don't have clients, you can do projects. You can write, you can think uh, about um, architecture. Pardon? I hear a voice. Please be kind and of, if you don't want to say something, please be kind and turn off the microphone. Thank you. Um, okay, so we continue. This was the man. So, you know, he was somehow uh, uh, at a crossroads, you know, between Belgium and, and Germany. And uh, he said, there is a hybrid quality in his work. No, and I think, no. Please be kind and turn off the microphone. Thank you. 
um, this hybridity is also in his personality, was also in his personality. Uh, he was a man still immersed in what we call tradition, but um, he was able to take risks and his architecture has a complexity which is uh, easily uh, uh, seen in, 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 in most of his works. Maybe some works by him could be considered impure if, if by that word we mean uh, exactly that hybridity that I mentioned is, is possible. But it's also a sign of, of complexity, which I think uh, uh, is, shouldn't, be, shouldn't be banished in the name of a so-called uh, uh, simplicity, which is too easily arrived at. I mean, I know Brunkus advocated simplicity, but, but for, for Brunkus, simplicity was at the end of the road, not at the beginning, it was something to arrive at by approaching slowly and painfully, perhaps with difficulties, the essence of things. So it's a big difference between simple and simplistic. What is simple is, uh, is a condensation of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, based on the essence of something, but, but simplistic is something, uh, you know, easily arrived at, arrived at and not very valuable actually. I mean, you see the interior here. This is a 19th century interior, maybe very early 20th, maybe, maybe. But when I look at this interior, I, I, I'm not sure I, 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 I reject this interior. Maybe I'm just nostalgic, but there is a level of uh, even aesthetical interest here, you know, a level of richness that that richness kind of is missing many times today in the name of so-called make white cubes without uh, uh, sloping roofs. You know, even the way he's dressed, even his look, you know, you, you, you see a man who is uh, contemplative, you know, who, uh, who looks uh, far away, he's thinking. Yes, there is no one else working in his office, but uh, he left something behind him. Let's look at some of his drawings. A line is a force, beautiful line from, uh, uh, I mean, linguistic line as opposed to the graphic line from Harry van der Velt. A line is a force. Very well put it really. And maybe this is something we should remember as well. A line is a force or could be a force. Uh, sorry for the resolution here. Uh, he published a lot. His work was published uh, and uh, uh, there, there were many influences in his work that you can tell this, this man was uh, at the crossroads, cultural crossroads uh, in Europe. He did this proposal for a Nietzsche memorial. Uh, why don't we do something like this? For example, maybe some of you would love to read Friedrich Nietzsche, maybe, and hopefully. Okay, let's read Friedrich Nietzsche. And uh, he is not the least uh, interesting uh, philosopher in the world. He was a poet and he wrote very eloquently with a lot of passion. But after you read, let's say, also Sprax Zarathustra, so spoke Zarathustra, maybe you think, what, how, would, how would I build a house for Nietzsche or a memorial? You know, it could be a very interesting exercise to try to express architect architecturally uh, what you got from reading uh, Friedrich Nietzsche. And uh, here we look at a drawing done by uh, uh, Van der Velt uh, that, that uh, was inspired, I'm sure, by uh, reading Nietzsche because I don't think he just uh, drew a, a memorial for him without uh, reading some of his writings. If you connect architecture with other cultural fields, Truly, this would be very inspirational because architecture, if architecture is not connected with uh, as many cultural fields, then, then what? Architecture is truly, uh, if it was considered for, for a long time, the queen of the arts, it's exactly because of this, because of its hybridity, its complexity, its connection with many things, with life itself. And, and uh, uh, anyway. 
And what is good about trying to connect architecture with other fields of, uh, of uh, cultural fields is that even in the moments of, let's say, economic, uh, uh, you know, uh, downfalls or whatever, you have support from those other fields. They sustain you. And you can continue to, 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 to work in architecture, even theoretically. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, Le Corbusier and Frank Lloyd Wright for 10 years, they didn't have commissions. Le Corbusier worked on Ville Radieuse, his urban planning for Paris. Uh, Frank Lloyd Wright worked for Broadacre City. So, you know, good architects never stop, even if they don't have commissions. They, they find ways to remain or become architects. It's actually a pro process of, of not just being, but also becoming you can paint, you can draw, you can think, you can uh, write, you can write a manifesto, you can write a poem, you can make projects, you can do many things. Architecture is beautiful if it is like this, rich, uh, a condensation of many interests. You'll never get bored like this. So Van der Velt, if he couldn't build, you know, he could have painted. If he could, if he could not have painted, he could have uh, written uh, architectural theory. He could have done many things. And architects in general are good at doing other things. You should never forget this. Now, could we say that this rendering is something, uh, you know, obsolete or, uh, you know, unimportant or uh, irrelevant to us? I don't think so. I think that the, if this was built today, would be as relevant as when at the time when 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 he built when when he drew it. So let's let's look at some of his buildings. This is from 1895, 1896, so the turn of the century, as it was called, his first private residence in Belgium, 1895, 1896. Yes, the certain architects would say this is a certainly a building that uh, belongs to the so-called past, but I wouldn't agree. It, it, yes, it has a sloping roof indeed. Yes, it has oblongs at the windows, but, but there is more to this building, I think. It is perfectly symmetrical. Yes, it's true, but uh, um, I, I, I feel there is also a level of innovation here. Maybe the roofing is not as is not well not maybe it's not placid. There is also if you try to imagine the plan, you know there are uh, walls here that uh, show a configuration which is not uh, straight or rectangular. So the building has a certain uh, melody, if I can use such a word, that that evokes. Uh, the advancement, the adv advancement. Uh, there is a quest for. Uh, a certain level of novelty. Although, yes, there is a sentimental um, 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 crafting of, of, the, of this facade, but uh, sentim se sentiments or nostalgia even are uh, general human uh, attributes or feelings. So 1895. We don't use, at least in, in, in our country, we don't use oblongs, as far as I know too often. And I think oblongs are not only aesthetically pleasing, but also they allow you to negotiate with a, with a street in, 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 in more flexible ways, in terms of light, in terms of sound, in terms of noise. I truly think oblongs um, should be reconsidered and should be reconsidered creatively. They shouldn't necessarily be done in this way. Just the idea of, a, of an oblong, you know, which, which would allow you to, as I said, to negotiate with various conditions of light, with various conditions of sound or noise. Uh, and there is, unfortunately, a lot of noise on our streets because of the cars. So an oblong could, uh, could help. 
And I know what I'm talking about because I lived in such an apartment in Sibiu, which had oblongs, and uh, um, it, it was very pleasing to to um, to have them. Even the act of uh, you know activating them uh, uh, according to the need, you can. Uh, create a small uh, uh, space between them so light is you truly could could uh, could uh, generate many uh, conditions in the interior just by moving in a certain way at certain angles the oblongs i would strongly advocate and there are some some uh, countries that that use oblongs uh, creatively we could do that too i think So uh, this is an interior decoration of uh, this art gallery, Maison de l'Art Nouveau uh, in Paris. I don't think it still exists. Uh, it doesn't. So the Franco-German art dealer and publisher Siegfried Bring, Bing played a key role in publicizing the style, meaning uh, the Art Nouveau. Bing opened a new gallery at uh, 22 Rue de Provence in Paris, the Maison de l'Art Nouveau, devoted to new works in both the fine and decorative arts. The interior and furniture of the gallery were designed by the Belgian architect, Henri van der Velt, one of the pioneers of Art Nouveau architecture. Now, maybe when the pandemic goes away, let's hope it does, although it doesn't uh, give signs that he's willing to do so, uh, but hopefully it will somehow recede or go away. Uh, I tr truly, truly uh, suggest uh, to young architects and older architects and students of architecture to animate the, 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 the spirit, in fact, by also contemplating, you know, opening an uh, art architecture gallery, uh, thinking about new ways. It's extremely important that we do not remain stuck in, 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 the, in the, you know, in the already seen. And, this is what was done all the time. And this is why Brinkush left Romania. He went to Paris because he wanted to be there in the proximity of the cultural volcano that Paris was. But now, because of the internet, we are connected with Paris, with Brussels, with New York, with uh, Sydney, with Tokyo. We can create cultural islands of great intensity of creation, creativity, exactly where we are. We don't have to, to leave, actually. You can, you can leave digitally, virtually, but you can remain in one place, but make that place boil with culture, with creativity. And I, I, I truly think it's very possible. An interior of this museum in Hagen in Germany, I don't have pictures, villa as in Schep Schepnitz in Germany. This is an interesting building. I like this building. So the one who says ab ovo, no sloping roofs is wrong because you can use sloping roofs very creatively and in a, in a, in a very modern and even 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 in an avant-garde way like Shinohara did and I showed it uh, just the other day so you know I really had it with with this uh, dogmatic view no sloping roofs well it depends how you do it you can do it very creatively and you can also be extremely boring by doing a terrace jardin, meaning no sloping roofs. So, you know, we have to get rid of these simplistic views of architecture that a sloping roof is by, by definition wrong and the flat roof is by definition good. It's not so at all. <laughs> Anyway, I, I, I get uh, almost angry when I think about these uh, precepts, as if they come from God. Anyway, look at this house, you know, it's, 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 it's even chromatically, you know, you have the yellowish and the bluish and the, they are complementary colors. Uh, and, um, you know, the corner is a difficult one. He's not, he's not an inhibited and inhibiting architect. Uh, I like him because he's not, he's not uh, dogmatic. And maybe, maybe his interest in other fields of, of culture, like painting, uh, helped him. You know, and I, I'm sure he did. Is this building uh, old fashioned or passe? I don't think so. Uh, if I pass by, and I didn't know it was by Henri van der Velt, 
I would have stopped and I, it would have stirred up my, 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 uh, uh, my imagination and my curiosity. Look what is going on here. You know, look at this corner. You know, look at this uh, batteries, or I don't know how to call it here. So there are interesting things here. Uh, you know, even this large veranda in, in the corner and there is creativity here. Even the interior, no? Uh, sorry, the picture is not very large, but, uh, you know, uh, there is even space here. Maybe even Bruno Tsevi would have loved it. We are dealing with a major architect and a major cultural figure in Europe. One about whom is not talked a lot about in the school, and that's too bad. Not that he's the only one. Everything is an event, you know, it's an event as it is supposed to be. An extension and interior decoration of the Nietzsche, I guess he loved Nietzsche or I don't know, archive in Weimar in Germany, this was just the interior, I only found the pictures of the interior, but look even here, you know, there are very interesting things happening. And again, you know, we have in our school, uh, two different faculties, the one of, for uh, interior architecture and the one for architecture, as if they are not both architects. The architect is supposed to do also the interior and the, the so-called interior architect could also design exterior architecture and some do. And as an example is this brilliant young woman from, from Incu, Patricia Erimescu, who finished her studies at the faculty of interior and then went to Africa 24 or 25 and built a library. Yes, she built a library and I found out about it from some important website like Design or uh, uh, Design Boom, I, I forgot. But anyway, her work was brilliant and she did it immediately after she finished her studies in the, in the, in the, in the section of interior architecture. But she built a library, a whole library. It's not big. But she has all the admiration I'm capable of, of, of having for what she did. This interior, this room by uh, Henri van, van der Velt, it also shows, you know, it's, it's, it's subtle. It's, it's, uh, it, this is architecture. This is not interior architecture. This is architecture. In as much as Broadacre City by, by uh, Frank Lloyd Wright was, although that was urbanism. You know, an architect, uh, he, there is, Palladio himself said, you know, the room is like the street. Well, he, I found uh, what he said that in two different ways. One, that the city is a, is a big villa and the villa is a small city. Or, you know, the room is like the house, the house is like the, the street, the street is like the city and vice versa. In other words, the architect does the interior of of a building uh, does the street, uh, does the city and, and vice versa. Meaning you work in the macrocosm and the microcosm with equal ease and with equal passion, with equal, uh, 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 you know, affection. Okay, Bauhaus University Weimar. Yes, before, before Walter Gropius, it was Henry van der Velt who built the, 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 the the, the, the Bauhaus University building in Weimar, because the Bauhaus didn't start in Dessau in 1926. It started in 1919 in Weimar. And it was, yes, him, Henri van der Velt, who built this building. And in my opinion, if I compare what he did with what, and I have, I have, uh, I have uh, uh, a lot of respect, and maybe even love for Walter Gropius. But I'm not sure his building is better than what only Van der Velt did. It's too bad I don't think I have a picture here with, uh, with what Gropius built. Uh, but uh, here it is the building that only Van der Velt built and it's not bad at all. And yes, it has a sloping roof. So what, is it a crime? No, not at all, quite the opposite. Uh, the building, I think, is richer, sorry, uh, Walter Gropius, than, than, than the one you built. In, and strangely also, because the, the, 
the, the, the call to arms of Walter Gropius was to unite the arts. Strangely, actually, Henri van der Velde suggested this unity more than he did through, his, through this building. I mean, look, this is a side of that building. Even this is interesting, you know, it's, it's rich, it's simple, yes, but it's also, it's not simplistic. It has a certain complexity. These windows are different from this window. This one also is different. I mean, spirit is similar, but different dimensions. And look at this arch here. And there are subtle things here going on. This is architecture. Uh, and uh, yes, some might say, well, these embroidered uh, parapets here, you know, are old fashioned. Yeah, but look at the, the large windows. And uh, so there is this uh, fluctuation, this tension between, between the past and the present, meaning his present, but maybe our present as well. I like this building. And really, I feel like... Uh, like uh, challenging Walter Gropius, that I don't truly think that Walter Gropius went really, uh, um, you know, towards a superior plane of uh, architectural existence with his uh, building, as opposed to this one. So again, when I hear that no sloping roof by definition, uh, we should say, wait a minute, let us contemplate the building for the Bauhaus by Henri van der Velde, which has a sloping roof, but also has creativity, has innovation. Look how the glass here turns also, uh, uh, you know, uh, upwards uh, on, on the sloping roof. There are interesting things, not to speak about the inside, because here you could very well have see the the, 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 the carpentry, uh, you know, uh, of, 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 of the room, you can see the, the structure of the roof. It could be very interesting as opposed to a flat, flat roof. It's a fine building. Now the clubhouse of the <laughs> Chemnitzer Loan Tennis Club, it was demolished. Uh, too bad it was demolished, but look even here, you know, it, it, there is modernity, there is also a clan day towards the past, you look at these ornaments, which, in my opinion, are not obsolete, and they enhance otherwise a blank wall, so there are here subtle gestures towards ornamentation, which uh, bring sensibility uh, the, the spirit of fineness, l'esprit de finesse to the building. Uh, a mansion for Karl Ernst Osthaus in Hagen in Germany. Uh, again, sloping roof, right? And in fact, the roof almost uh, descends to this portion of the wall, at least uh, chromatically, uh, if not uh, in some other way. But there are complexities here, which I like. You know, it's it's it's... It's an architecture which is rich. I mean, really, aren't we tired of the white cubes, for God's sake? I mean, for how long are we are we going to build white white cubes? You know. I mean, look at this building. It's not a white cube, is it? The bizarre thing is that w some people think that if we use white cubes and no sloping roofs, we are modern. <laughs> Maybe we would have been modern 100 years ago, but I'm not so sure we'll still be so-called modern because, because modernity means exactly this, change. This is, this is in its essence the meaning of the word modern. The great French poet Charles Baudelaire, and there are 200 years since his birth, this year. Charles Baudelaire who was also an excellent art critic. He understood very well the essence of art. He said art has two halves. One half is about the eternal, the immutable, the permanent. But the other half is about the circumstantial, the temporary, the ephemeral. And that is the modern side of art. The one that changes according to the time. So to be modern today is not to repeat what was done 100 years ago. If you do what was done 100 years ago, you're actually anti-modern. 
because you are stuck in a past which is not ours. To be modern in the present, you have to belong to your time. And to, to belong to our time is, is, is very different from belonging to 1920s. Is this so difficult to understand? I mean, today, if you look at, uh, at buildings done by and proposed by, uh, by students uh, in, in some very important schools on Sucker Punch Daily, you will not see one single white cube with projects from Harvard, AA, Princeton, Columbia, SciArc, Bartlett, you name them. This says nothing. Why aren't the professors here and some assistants so we can talk? Maybe I'm wrong, but let's talk, let's debate. Why are they not here? Because they are not interested in our event of health, that's why. And by turning their backs on him, they also turn their backs on architecture. Anyway, uh, so a non-modern non -modern building, right? <laughs> when this man was an innovator, actually. We really have to wake up. We have to wake up because otherwise we remain stuck at the margins of culture and architecture. And we cannot do this, really. There is no excuse. We are part of Europe. We are part of the network. We can inform ourselves just as well as a Belgian does or an Egyptian or a North American or a Japanese. We have exactly the same tools at, at our disposal. It, 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 is, it is really up to us to be informed or not. Okay, another house, by a private house in Weimar, in Germany, Weimar, the great, uh, the great German, uh, German city, 1907, 1908. Um, yes, of course, when you look at this building, you say, wait a minute, you know, I only love Villa Savoie. But let's be honest, is Villa Savoie truly so great? I mean, aren't we tired of uh, the, the, those uh, precepts? Because he used precepts, the, you know, the so-called, uh, you know, open, open uh, plan. And uh, it, personally, I have problems and I love Le Corbusier, don't get me wrong. I don't think anyone paid homage to him as I did 15 days nonstop in a row from Monday to Friday. Uh, you know, uh, paying homage to him. But I have to say, Villa Savoie is not so convincing as uh, its fame seems to suggest. Those thin white column, uh, you know, uh, that this supports the house, uh, <laughs> if you enter with a car there, as he, as he suggested or, uh, you know, uh, designed the building for, uh, <laughs> It would have been very easy to 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 crush them, to 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 destroy those columns. They are so artificially placed. In fact, it's amazing that a, a complex man like Le Corbusier and certainly an artist uh, um, didn't realize how inorganic or non-organic that building was, how unnatural in a way. I think Bernard Chumi was right when. Uh, uh, when, uh, when he wrote in a, in a turbulent way that the most uh, architectural thing about uh, Villa Savoie, Savoie immediately after the war was its uh, stage of uh, state of decay. It was the son rebelling the, against the father, so to speak. But we need rebelling sons the, against their fathers because this creates the, the, the continuum of culture, of life. And sometimes you oppose the father, not because you don't have affection towards him, quite the opposite. You oppose him because you love him. I know this sounds uh, too Nietzschean because Nietzsche thought that a friend is less of a, well, that, that an enemy is, is, uh, is, uh, is uh, your best friend because by opposing you, forces you to reconsider certain things and to grow in a more complex way. It's the same thing with the relationship between the father and the son, or at the level of culture, you know, between uh, Bernard Chumi and Le Corbusier, referring to the example I gave. So things are complex, just fight off dogma. Dogma has nothing to do, if there is something against creativity, is dogma. 
I, I don't think anything uh, done in, in uh, you know, uh, activated by dogmas uh, leads to, to creativity, no. There should be dialogue, there should be interpretations, there should be a debate. Really, you the students, you, it's your duty to fight for your freedom of thought. If a professor says, don't use a sloping roof, you should say, professor, with all due respect, let's talk about the sloping roof and let's talk about the terrace and let's see which one is more of a criminal than the other. You know, why are we banishing one and not banishing the other one? What are the good reasons? Because a certain man at the, at the beginning of the 20th century wrote, uh, uh, something uh, banishing uh, uh, the sloping roof or banishing ornament, that's why. But we are 100 years later, Professor, are we not? Okay, another memorial for Ernst uh, in Jena in collaboration with the sculptors. Here again, we see a collaboration between an architect and two artists. Couldn't you also do the same? Why shouldn't students in architecture also cooperate with, you know, artists from, uh, uh, you know, even uh, even high school students from Tonica, engage in a dialogue with the arts? It would help your work, I'm sure. Not to speak about engaging the students at urbanism or the Faculty of Interior and work together with them towards a project that is uh, that is uh, collective. We can only learn from each other. But if we are stuck in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in our little white box, uh, inevitably we, we, we generate things that are uh, monotonous and then repeating themselves ad infinitum. So they did this building, similar to the memorial to Friedrich Nietzsche, isn't it? Now, you tell me, is this better than this? I mean, really, is this a progress compared to this? I'm not so sure. I'm sorry. I mean, I know uh, some people would say, wait a minute, this is progress. This is uh, modernity. This is a white, uh, clean, uh, clean building. But why is it better than this? If one could explain to me. Anyway. Uh, Palace for Graf Dürkheim in Weimar, again, in Germany. Uh, it's, it's a, sorry, um, sometimes I like to, to show details of the building, but uh, even this building is, you know, is rich, is complex, is, uh, it has a, a rich, uh, uh, you know, articulation of, of, of various parts. Now, a theater. Uh, at the Deutsche Werkbund. Unfortunately, this was destroyed. Can you believe it? This is the human madness. This was a night, it was built in 1914 in Köln or Cologne in Germany. And in a few months, it was destroyed because the First World War started. So this is the great, great, inviolable human wisdom, right? We build a theater by uh, Henri van der Velt. We also built a great building by Walter Gropius on the same, uh, on the grounds of the same exhibition. That one is destroyed as well. So there, welcome to Homo sapiens. Look at this uh, building. What is wrong with this building? I like it. Why was it destroyed? Why did the first war start? Because we are certainly not wise. That's why. And we are self-destructive. It's very sad that this building was destroyed. <clears throat> and as I said, other buildings on the same, on the grounds of the same exhibition were destroyed. Some of them excellent buildings, like I just mentioned, the one by uh, uh, Walter Gropius and I think Hans Meyer. Anyway, um, Teatro Verbund, Henri van der Velt, demolished. Quite a large building. 
And it didn't last, as I said, for more than a few months. In 1914, it was, uh, uh, you know, the grand opening of the exhibition. And also in 1914, everything was demolished and the war started. A villa from 1913, 1914, also in Germany. If I compare this building with some buildings in brick by uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, yes, Frank Lloyd Wright is more uh, outgoing, is advocating his uh, freedom horizontally. Van der Velt is more uh, ambiguous or ambivalent about uh, excessive uh, optimism, about going outwardly. Uh, this is Europe. This is not the United States. So maybe the sloping roof um, negotiates with the limits, with the inevitable limits uh, present in, uh, on, on, on the European soil. I think it's a good building. And um, the advocate of, uh, of the flat, uh, flat roof uh, could say whatever he might want to say. I, I really don't see, see a great progress in the, in the flat roof. And I can say why, because a, a roof is the, the, the intermediate between the building and the sky. It's, I mean, look even at a human being, right? We have hair, we, the people have coiffures, there are even wigs, no? Uh, Johann Sebastian Bach had a beautiful wig and so did uh, André Le Nôtre, and so did uh, Louis Le Soleil. Well, imagine we were all bald or all with a terra jardin on our heads, you know, with a, with a flat head, you know. In a way, the, the, the flat roof, uh, it, it means a flat head. You know, uh, it, it would be grotesque to, to, to have, uh, try to imagine people on the street where all they all have a, a terrace jardin on their heads. <laughs> I mean, Truly, often, I mean, maybe Wolf Briggs was right when he said there are architects who belong to the underground. He gave, the, as an example, uh, Raymond Abraham and architects who belong to the middle ground, the middle part of the building. And he gave, as an example, uh, Stephen Hall and architects who belong to the roof, do roof architecture. And he gave himself as, a, as an example and Zaha Hadid. The roof indeed is a, is a is uh, uh, it has the potentiality for, for uh, uh, connecting with a certain exuberance of the building. The, the roof, I mean, let's think of Chambord, no? the glorious uh, castle uh, chateau that uh, Francois Premier uh, built, where the roof is a mini Man Manhattan, in fact, more splendid than Manhattan because it has the, the, the sculpturalness of, of the Renaissance. And, and you know, so what are the great, 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 not even in terms of preserving the energy within the building, a flat roof is, uh, is the best option. It isn't because a, a roof like this protects better the building from, uh, you know, uh, losses of energy, excessive heat or excessive cold and so on. Not to speak about the beauty and the mystery sometimes of the attic. I love the attics. So what does Le Corbusier say with his flat roofs? He eliminates the attic. As a kid, I loved to go into the attic of my grandparents, you know, to discover old books or an old piece of clothes or an old icon or something. Why well, we kill, we really killed architecture from, from all its richness in the name of what? At the time when this happened, there were reasons, but not any longer. I think we should bring back the mystery of the attic, let's put it this way. I love attics and painters love attics too. And he was a painter, you know. Painters love to, 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 to paint in attics, you know. That's where they have their easels. That's where they do their secret paintings. Let's bring back the attic. And the, you know, the triangular aesthetics that usually the attic has. Okay, another building, what is this for Theo Kerner in Schebnitz, uh, a big villa as well. Uh, even here, you know, it is complexity. At the first sight, you say, yeah, just another building. Well, I don't think it's just another building. And I just talked about the roof. And uh, look here, you know, you have the 
the, 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 the these rooms at, 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 at you know just under the roof which yes they are less comfortable than these they have different functions but they they make a transition you know from from this part of the building to what is above the building and maybe uh, that transition is necessary not to forget La Nouvelle Maison, uh, his private residence in Belgium, 1927, 1928. That's exactly when Villa Savoie came into being. Now, this is a smaller building. It's, uh, it's a reticent building. It's not a building. It has a level of modernity that is appreciable compared to some of the previous buildings. Probably his resources were also more limited. But even here we see subtleties. Now look at this balcony, look at this uh, little window here, look how the door is, is, is crafted, look at this a little bit curved wall here, uh, you know, and the curvature here in the opposite way in the corner here. So it's a gentle building, but it's a building that it is modern, it's clear, it's modern. It uses masonry though, uh, but uh, I think this kind of gentle modernity is something worth uh, studying and contemplating again. Less radical, but uh, with virtues which the more radical ones do not have. I would say that even the buildings by Miss van der Rohe, uh, the, the early buildings have virtues which later on he kind of uh, I mean, not kind of, he, he, he uh, gave up on and wasn't really a, a great progress, I, I would say. Anyway, he even made it with his own house on a, on a stamp, as you can see. Home for the elderly of uh, this place in Hanover in Germany, 1929-1931. I like the fact that he also assumed the public dimension of art, of architecture. Uh, you know, this is not a private residence; is a is a is a is a is a place for a, for a larger group of people, and I think it's 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 done very well. You know, it is modern, but it's a soft modernity, a so-called gentle modernity that I mentioned uh, already, um, and. Uh, what can I say? Uh, he, he was able to work in various ways. And Brick, as always, is a very, very good friend for the architect. Brick always knows how to, 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 to rejuvenate our affection towards it. Because yes, with Brick, we can do wonders. Even if we are not Le Corbusier, we can do wonders if we understand what the brick is, the, 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 the magical uh, construction material which the brick is, because it is magical. And it comes from the earth. Uh, both the earth and the sun and fire love the brick, and so does the architect. Here we have a flat roof. Here it would have been more difficult to have a sloping roof because of the big size of the building. If he would have made it, uh, you know, a sloping roof, it would have been uh, more difficult to make a gracious one. So it's okay. What I'm trying to say is, let allow the architect or the student in architecture to create according to his or her, uh, uh, you know, preferences. One might like a flat roof. Another one might like a sloping roof. It's okay. Uh, it's okay. Let's uh, let's allow for diversity. A polyclinic and villa lending for this doctor uh, in uh, in Ghent in Belgium, 1933-1935. Uh, a very different building now from the previous one. Uh, again, what I call the gentle modernism of Henri van der Velde, um, and. Um, what can I say? I like it. What I see here, I like.
Is this a building which died aesthetically? I don't think so. No, quite the opposite. It's a, it's a jewel coming from the past. And I think it contributes to the environment it finds itself in. A library. This is an interesting library, 1933, 1938. The Tower of Books. Think about it. So not an office tower, but a tower of books, the tower for books. Uh, here it is, a tower indeed, um, with a symbolic meaning, of course, because, uh, you know, it, it's like Van der Velt was, uh, was uh, allowed about, uh, about uh, the importance of knowledge. Um, I just read today on Arch Daily, an architect, a lady, she said, uh, we shouldn't leave behind waste, but knowledge. And uh, I, I think her phrase is worth uh, our consideration. You know, we are not very concerned with knowledge. We are very concerned with consuming, 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 when in fact we are extremely rich Every day I, 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 I feel blessed that now at, in a difficult time because of the pandemic, I have a poor old laptop and I have the ability to connect with, uh, you know, thoughts coming from other parts of the world. I have the ability to study whatever I would like to study. I even have the ability to do some, some um, digital uh, architectures uh, using an old version of Archicad. What I'm trying to say, we are very, very rich and we should feel very, very blessed that we have the ability to connect, you know, from the comfort of our homes. Uh, whenever we, we feel like it, we can exchange ideas, we can show each other's uh, works. Uh, so uh, I'm not saying, uh, you know, everything is fine, but many things are actually uh, uh, worth um, uh, appreciating. So here it is, um, you know, Henri van der Velt with his, uh, uh, let me see again, the tower. Again, we have the culmination, the top of the building. The top of the building is different from the rest of the building and it is supposed to be just as this one is different because it's the coiffure of the building, right? Uh, I, I, I don't have at this, at this point in my life the ability to create such a coiffure for myself. But unless I use a wig, uh, which I don't like, but uh, look what he did here at the top of the tower. You know, it's probably a very interesting space here at the top. And yes, the, the building stands out and it's a building not destined for commerce, not for making money, but for, for knowledge, for culture, for books. Uh, maybe we need such towers, you know, all over the world, the towers of knowledge. I'm not so sure that this uh, this part of the building is uh, highly inspiring. Maybe it could have been done a little more sensitively, but, uh, you know, he was affected himself about the so-called uh, modern wind, which was blowing, blowing and blowing. But the, the interior space is nice, you know, with a lot of light and uh, anyway, and look at it. You know, it's uh, there are other towers here, but this this alone is, is is the tower of knowledge, the tower of books. Yeah, I, I think it could have been done a little more sensitively, the tower to kind of connect in a way with the history of Ghent and also be more. But but easy to talk uh, on the first floor, though, there are very interesting things going on. Like, look, look at this uh, lobby, you know. I like it. It's it's uh, yes, it has a grid, it has a rectangularity, but it, it has a monumentality and um, uh, it's interesting visually, aesthetically. The technical school, uh, the build the school building eleven in Belgium. Um, this is a newer work, so it was 1936, 1942. Well, difficult times then in Europe. 
I think it was refurbished, or I, I, I know this, this building confused me a little bit. Uh, is I'm not very sure exactly what he did, or some parts, this, he did this. And there are interesting things here. I mean, look, look at this. You know, accidents are always welcomed or to be welcomed because, um, you know, just as we need diagonals, even this diagonal of the shadow, we need uh, differences. And then the diagonal uh, is a difference. In a Cartesian system, the diagonal shows, and you'll see it also in the next presentation on the remarkable engineer I will talk about who had a brilliant idea to bring the diagonals, but yet not just for the sake of the form of the diagonal. We'll talk about it very soon. The Belgian pavilion at the 1937 Paris Exposition. Um, now you see here again, he uses the flat roof, a large building, a public building, it's okay. Uh, but still we see only Van der Velt uh, with, uh, with uh, that, what I call the gentle modernist, that he is not, uh, is not that radical architect who wants to break away from everything. So uh, he is welcoming innovation, but he is also uh, considerate towards uh, other things, the past, the context, and so on. A train station from 1937, um, Here he uses the, the sloping roof. And he uses the sloping roof and he uses the terrace in the same building. It's okay. It can be done. Let's just not be dogmatic. The Belgian building for the 1939 New, New York World's Fair. Uh, this was uh, an interesting uh, World's Fair. And the symbols of this world, World's Fair were the trilon and the sphere built by uh, uh, Wallace a very interesting architect who received even the admiration of Rem Kolhas. Um, and um, the time will come when I'll make a presentation on him too. But unfortunately, with these exhibitions, just as it happened in Cologne, in Köln, the buildings were demolished, were destroyed. I think, I'm not sure about this particular building or it was re re relocated. Sometimes this happens. The Bells for Peace. He created the, 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 you know, this tower with the bells for peace. And yes, we should have such bells all over the world because we are quite capable of starting a new deadly war at any time, unfortunately. So we do, we should be reminded of, of peace. And I'm glad that this architect um, did this in 1939. Unfortunately, the war was right at the door, uh, sad very, very sad. But even if there are fatalities that we cannot, uh, we cannot somehow uh, fight with, we still have to try to fight with. Goya fought through his uh, great series of engravings, disasters of war. Picasso fought through his great painting, Guernica. And uh, the architect should also fight. In, in, in his or her own way, for, for, for peace, yes. Anyway, um, Belgium and Congo. Congo, I see that Congo maybe was a colony of Belgium. I, I don't know, but um, I like the fact that uh, in, on, on, on the corner of the same building, it is mentioned Belgium and Congo. And it says this is the Belgian Congo, you know, uh, it was not Belgium, it was the Belgian Congo. And you can see the, the you know, the base reliefs. Anyway, furniture. We'll end our presentation on uh, Henri van der Velt. And he, he deserves uh, to amplify this presentation. And I would welcome, you know, other voices because I think the occasion to celebrate an important architect uh, should bring together other people. So, you know, if one wants to add something in five or 10 minutes or half an hour or even one hour, it's fine. Furniture. The furniture is also very elegant, you know, and uh, again, could I say that this chair is uh, 
uh, less pleasing and less uh, cre creative and less significant than, uh, let's say, a chair by uh, Le Corbusier, which probably was designed rather by Charlotte Perrion, who worked for him. I don't know. I'm not so sure. Look at this desk. What is wrong with this desk? Nothing is wrong with this desk, nor with the chair, the beautiful chair. I wish I had such a desk and I wish I had such a chair. I don't and I never will, but I admire it. Uh, if, if the straight line is the line of duty and the curved line is the line of beauty, then he has both uh, beauty and beauty. Uh, anyway, it's a nice desk. A little table, another interesting chair. And I keep saying, uh, and I actually should say to myself, let's design chairs. It's very rewarding and even therapeutic. It's a very nice exercise to try to, to try to make a chair, your chair. Paintings, because he was also a painter. Influenced, of course, there are influences from Vincent van Gogh uh, from the Pointillis, uh, it's okay. It's okay. There are influences in the work of all of us. And uh, uh, the important thing is to remain open and to enjoy life and to enjoy creativity and to express what is within you. As uh, Stephen Hall said, if there is idealism in you, express it. very well what's here. It's almost like a small uh, human silhouette, but it cannot be so small. Uh, I don't know. It's, it's, it's just, a, a, you know, a, an accident, so to speak. Now, this is clearly derived from, uh, from uh, the, the great uh, Vincent van Gogh. That's it. 